Hi friends, welcome and thank you for joining us today. We are so thankful that we can gather as church and uh, we are deeply thankful for our volunteers who has really just jumped in last minute to make this possible. We appreciate you, we love you and uh, you are deeply valued. So this morning if you are joining us for the first time, we also want to welcome you and pray that you'll just experience the presence of God in a new and fresh way and uh, yeah, enjoy the time with us. I would also like to bring to your attention a few things in the weeks ahead. Um, Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday is approaching quickly and don't get too used to us streaming three times a day. Um, for now we're doing it at half past eight, quarter past ten and six o'clock at night. But what we want to achieve over um, Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday is a really strong community feel and oneness. Um, so we want to get together one single time on that day so we'll only have a quarter past ten um, stream. Make sure that you make note of that. We've also launched an initiative over this 21 days where we want to inspire families and households to really sit around the communion table. And our family, including our three kids, um, would like to join you every morning at nine o'clock. Um, go to our YouTube channel and we'll use communion together and also spend time on a specific prayer topic. We've got a 21 day prayer challenge. Um, we're only on day three of lockdown. On Friday, we prayed for our government and authorities. Um, yesterday, we prayed for our small business owners. And today, we really want to dedicate to our medical staff, everybody working in hospitals, doctors, nurses, um, that really make sure that the hospitals can keep on going the way that they are. I also want to point you to my colleague, Lunar. He's going to show you a little bit around on the platform. Um, this platform is um, as new to you as it is to us and we would love you to just find your way easy around it and feel at home and navigate easily. So please have a listen to what Lunath has to share. Welcome Remembrance family and friends. I'm quickly going to show you an overview of the online platform. So, if you'll join me. First of all, you'll see here to your left is the video playing and to the right are all the extra tabs. Remember to unmute the video beforehand. You do have the option of putting the video in full screen. Just do keep in mind that the visibility of the features then disappears. But if you minimize, you'll see it again. Here, as you will see, is the button for the live prayer. Please feel free if you need prayer, one prayer, if you just want to talk to us. It is private. You'll see here at the chat, we encourage you to just connect with us by just saying hi. Do keep in mind that you have to create a nickname. This can either be your name or your family surname. Then you'll see here is the notes next to the chat. We, the notes we use to put the contact details for the church. You'll see the banking details and the announcements. So please make sure to have a good look there. To the right, you'll see the Bible. This feature is put in for any, anybody not being able to use the Bible or have one at hand. Please follow if you'd like. Then lastly, but not least, is the schedule. You can follow there to see the remaining services for the next few weeks. Please note that all the features that I just explained is also available on Android and iPhone. Just a different interface. As you'll see here, everything is still there. You have the video, the chat, the notes, the Bible, the schedule, and of course, the live prayer button. If you have any troubles, please contact us on the church's number, which you'll see in the notes. Thank you and enjoy the service.
So today's communion is definitely different to what we're all used to. But I want to bring you a message of hope as we have communion instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ. Communion is an action, an action of hope, an action of believing and trusting in the Lord's promises. We are proclaiming eternal life with Him. As we take the cup, the blood of Jesus, let us remember the first miracle done by Jesus where He turned water into wine. I believe when He did this, He gave us a gift a gift of eternal life. And he's also set the elements for the Holy Communion. As you take the bread, do we take part of Jesus' body that was broken on the cross, his arms stretched wide open, wide as the sky, to set us free. So let's eat and drink and remember what Jesus did for us. From the first miracle to the ultimate gift of eternal life, through his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's take a bit together.
Whilst the world is in turmoil, having affected us all in one way or the other, I hope remain not in the seen, but in the unseen. One cannot ignore the fact that change will happen, and therefore we should learn to embrace it, trusting not in ourselves, but in the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John 14 verse 1. I therefore wish to encourage you all during this time to seek the face of God and trust in Him to meet all your needs, whether financial, emotional or physical. Let's reach out to others, not physically, and offer our support. Whilst at the same time, if someone gives you a gift, accept it and thank the Lord. Give with a joyful heart and know that God will reward those who diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Please continue to support the church with your contributions, uh, whether it be tithes, offerings, or donations. The banking details will be on the screen, including the SnapScan information. I pray that you will endure and remain strong during this time, that you will seek the face of God, and that God will bless you and be with you. Welcome, church. And what a time to be sharing the Word of God with you. I trust by now, you are well and truly comfortable with your isolation and your social distancing. And I'm just reminding you to keep safe, wear your gloves, sanitize, and practice safe personal hygiene. It's a real interesting time to be sharing the Word of God with you. I had a real struggle to prepare a message because of everything that's been happening. And I thought, <clears throat> especially considering the lockdown, what's happening in the world around us, uh, social distancing, and these unprecedented times that we find ourselves in. So I wanted to bring a message that has a wow factor, a message with a real punch. And as I'm sitting preparing, I realized, realized that all I need to do is share the gospel, to encourage you with God's word, because he is the wow factor. And I trust him to deliver the punch, the fresh insights and he will bring the revelation and the Holy Spirit will make the word come alive in your hearts today. Amen. So the timing of this word is so appropriate. I was reminded of the scripture in Matthew 8 of the centurion um, who met Jesus on the road and he stopped and asked Jesus if he would heal his servant who was sick. And, um, and the centurion was a soldier, a high ranking officer and um, he said to, to Jesus that he's a man of authority and um, he understands if he commands people and instructs them to do something, they listen to him and they go and do it. And, um, and Jesus said that he will come and heal, uh, heal his servant. Um, and then the centurion said to him, he mustn't come. All he needs to do is speak the word. And, um, and Jesus was amazed at this man's faith. He spoke the word and said to him, his servant is healed. Although we're not physically together, um, and this is a little bit awkward to be bringing a message like this, but we, I'm grateful that we can have this medium, that we can still share the Word of God. So I pray that the Word of God will go forth today and that it will bring healing to your current situation. It will remove anxiety and fear and replace those feelings with peace and boldness to declare His Word over your situation. Amen. So while I was preparing, I started thinking about this virus. And, um, and I just want to share this with you this, um, during this session. And um, I was thinking about what the virus represents and what God represents, what his character is like. And the virus brings fear. God brings assurance and he brings peace. The virus brings anxiety. God brings calmness. The virus spreads panic. God brings self-control. The virus brings chaos. We serve a God of order. The virus brings with it destruction. God promises transformation and renewal. The virus brings despair, but our Heavenly Father brings joy and brings hope. The virus makes us feel as if we're in a hopeless situation but God gives us promises. The virus brings sickness, but God brings health. The virus brings death, but God brings life. 
So I just wanted to share that with you and encourage you to speak his words over your situation. Declare his words and his promises over your life in this time. So three weeks ago, we started a new series on covenant. And thus far, we covered the Lord's covenant with Adam, where Henny demonstrated so beautifully the meaning and importance of covenant. Vanessa passionately shared the covenant uh, between God and Noah. And during the session, I hope I can do justice to the importance of God's covenant with Abraham. The significance of God, God's covenant with Abraham is foundational to our faith. And it is critical that we understand fully the meaning, the message, and what it represents and what it embodies. Before we dive into the word and the Abrahamic covenant, let me recap some important aspects of covenant as shared by Henny, which will help illuminate today's message and will provide some context. Most people listening to this message today acknowledges the existence of God. But in order for us to discover more about him, to really know who he is and what he's like, we need to spend time in his presence, in his word. Many of us acknowledge his existence, but we don't quite know him yet, not intimately. We know about him, but we don't know him. Some people consider God as an impersonal influence, and there is no personal identification with him. People experience him as a distant, as distant, a judge waiting for us to get out of line and then give us a whack um, so that we can back, get back into line. Let me tell you and help you with the understanding of that. Some people have even said that this virus is God's wrath on the world. God is not angry with us. He exhausted his anger on his son, Jesus, the day he hung on the cross. He's not angry. However, I think he might be a little disappointed. And I'm sure he'll turn things around for the good for those who trust and love him for his glory. God, however, tells a different story about himself. He says that he loves us and he wants to bless us. Do you know that God loves you and that he wants to bless you? He does. And to prove that he loves us, he has taken initiative to enter into an eternal covenant of love with us. And this covenant is available to all who will enter into it. When you enter into this covenant with him and spend time in his presence, talking to him, fellowshipping with him, praying, you actually become conscious of him as a loving father. He is love. Love is the, the expression of our heavenly father. He loves us so much that he gave himself for us. He is not only perfect love, he is love. Richard Booker, in his book, The Miracle of the, Sacred, of the Scarlet Thread, sorry, says the following. Since he made us, he understands our limitations and he is sympathetic to our struggles. He knows our hearts because he knows our makeup. He was there before we were formed, so we can come to him without pretense, just as we are. He will receive us with compassion, with kindness, with understanding and affection. He is merciful and graceful towards us. He goes on to say, even though he knows the worst of us, he still loves us. We can always find a warm reception at Father's house. We are the constant object of his love and attention. The psalmist says it so beautifully in Psalm 8 verse 4. He says, what is man that you are mindful of him? So he thinks about us constantly. His concern and care for us is never ending. Is this the God you know? Jeremiah 9 this is 23 to 24, says the following. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let, let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth 
for in these I delight, says the Lord. Whatever your status is in life, God wants you to know him. He wants you to enter into this covenant of love with him. And he longs to have a personal relationship with you. So, let's get to know him. The New Testament and Old Testament is actually the New and the Old Covenant. I'm not going to spend too much time on defining this, as Henny has already explained this previously, and I only want to provide a framework and some perspective. Covenant in the Bible means a binding agreement between parties. In Hebrew, the verb meaning to seal a covenant translates literally as to cut. By definition, it is an agreement to cut a covenant by shedding of blood and walking between pieces of flesh. A blood covenant by two parties is the closest, the most enduring, the most solemn, and the most sacred of all contracts. When Hebrew males entered into a blood covenant, there was a very specific ceremony which included nine steps, which I want to recap quickly for those who missed it two weeks ago. I think it's really critical and uh, important for us to understand what these steps are so that we have a reference and a framework to fall back on. So the first step is to take off your robe. It's, it means I take off my robe and my robe represents who I am. I'm symbolically saying I'm giving you all of myself. I pledge my being and my life to you. Then the second step is to take off your belt. My belt holds my armor. It holds my dagger, my sword, my bow and my arrow. I'm saying I'm pledging my strength, my support and my protection to you. If anyone attacks you, they're also attacking me. Your battles are my battles and mine also yours. I will help defend and protect you and you do the same for me. The third step is to cut the covenant. Splitting an animal right down the middle, and this is done only in a covenant ceremony. After splitting, we lay it down, each half to the side of us, and we stand between the halves back to back. We then walk in a figure of eight through these halves, um, through the bloody halves, and come back facing each other. In doing so, we are doing two things. The first thing is we're saying we are dying to ourselves, we are giving up the rights to our own life and beginning a new walk with our covenant partner unto death. The second, since the blood covenant is the most solemn pact, we point down to each half and we say to God, God, do so to me and more if I break this covenant. That's quite a serious thing because you're saying to God that he can split you in half if you break this agreement. The fourth then is to raise the right arm and then you cut yourself and you mingle blood together and you swear allegiance to each other. This means we believe that our lives are intermingling and we are becoming one. The fifth is we exchanging names. I take your last name and you take mine. The sixth step is we make a scar. Once we've cut and we've rubbed the blood together, we make a scar as a permanent testimony to the covenant. The scar will bear witness to the covenant. It will always be there to remind us. If anybody seeks to harm you, you can just point to the scar and say, I'm standing in covenant with someone. So if you want to harm me, you better watch out because I've got a covenant partner that protects me. The seventh step, T's and C's apply. It's not only the banks who came up with that, that came from the Bible. All my assets is yours. All my money, all my property, all my animals. Just come and get if you need any. What's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine. The eighth step is that we eat a memorial meal together. We break bread and we have wine. Then the last is we plant a memorial. We now leave a memorial to the covenant by planting a tree and sprinkling it with the blood of the animals. The blood sprinkled on the tree and the scar will always be a testimony to our covenant. And that concludes the covenant ceremony. And from now on, we are friends standing in a covenant, which also includes our children and the unborn ones. Later, when they come to an age of understanding, they can decide if they want to remain in the covenant or if they want to reject it. <clears throat> 
every time the covenant is mentioned or referenced in the Bible, you are reminded of these nine steps. So with these ceremonial steps as background, let's look at the Abrahamic covenant. What was it Abram believed? We're going to look at that and answer that just now. God gave Abraham promises of hope and the future of blessing and prosperity. God promised him that his descendants would be like the stars of heaven. And during this time, during this promise, Abraham asked God, how could this be if I had not even fathered a son of my own flesh? It's been 500 years since the flood, and again the world has turned from God to worship idols. Abram's family was idol worshippers. They lived in the city of Ur, located in Babylon. It was a cultural, sophisticated, but pagan country. People worshipped the moon and made idols carved with their own hands to the moon goddess. It was from this environment that God called Abram to his covenant of love. God told Abram to get out of his pagan land and go to the country that God would show him and where God would bless him and make him a great nation. And out of Abram's seed, all nations of the world would be blessed. So God brings Abram out to the, to the land of Canaan, out of, the, of Babylon to the land of Canaan, and God approaches him in a way that he can understand by way of a covenant. I want to read with you what this covenant was in Genesis 15. We're reading from the first, uh, from 15, chapter, chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And we carry on from verse 5. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And then he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two, down the middle, and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down to the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Remember the nine steps of the covenant ritual? Covenant ceremony took place. This was the only way that Abram would understand that God was serious about his promises. So let's break this down a little and let's look at the meaning of these scriptures. Firstly, God said to Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. God is offering Abram his robe and his belt. God does not have a physical robe. He simply offers himself since the robe represents a person. He says, here I am, I offer you me, I am your reward, all that I am, I give to you, I am holy, I give you my holiness, 
I am righteous, I give you my righteousness. I give you my life, Abraham, pledging to lay it down on your behalf if you will accept this covenant and enter into it with me. Then God said again, I am your shield. I don't offer you a shield. I am your shield. I will protect and offer to protect you and fight your battles. I will be your strength. If anyone attacks you, they're really attacking me. Your battles are mine. Put me on as your full armor. He says, and out of your seed shall come a blessing to the whole world. I will bless you and I will make you a great nation and I'll give you a land of rest. God says, I'm taking initiative to make this covenant with you. Not that you deserve it, but because I love you. Abram says, that's really wonderful, Lord, and I appreciate it. But how will I know? So God tells him to gather the animals, a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. God is now talking in terms that Abram can relate to. Covenant talk. And remember, the covenant talk at that time, that was how people related to each other. That's how they became friends. That are, that's how they came into agreement and, um, uh, uh, and cut covenant. And, um, and here the Lord is making a covenant. So he's talking to Abram and on a level that he can understand. By splitting the animals down the middle and dividing the halves, Abram knows that God is making a promise, a covenant with him. Abram also knows that the blood covenant is the, most, is the closest, most enduring, and most sacred. There was only one problem, and that was, what does Abram have to offer in this covenant? What can I bring to this agreement? Remember, the covenant had two parties, and both pledged to this covenant. And he's saying, I'm making a covenant with the Creator. What do I have to offer? The only help we see that he can offer at this time in Genesis 15, 11, is Abram can offer is to chase away the vultures who wants to eat the sacrifice and devour the carcasses. We see Jesus says in Matthew 13, verse 4 and 9, he talks about the parable of the sower. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. And then he goes on to verse 19, and he says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches it away, that that was sown in his heart. You see, the vultures in Genesis represents Satan swooping in to break up this covenant before it is, com uh, before it is completed by snatching away the acceptable sacrifice. So we see Abram is trying to act as a, a sort of scarecrow by chasing them away. So God says, if I'm going to establish a covenant with man, I'm going to have to do it all if it's going to be done at all. He says, if you try to be righteous, if you try, it would not be an acceptable covenant. I am the only one who can make a covenant with me. And to make sure it works and you don't try and help, I'm going to put you to sleep through the entire ceremony. Then God puts Abram into a deep sleep. And whilst Adam, Abram is in this deep sleep, he sees passing between the animals someone taking his place. Now remember the steps of a covenant. There's two parties and both when they stand back to back, they start walking in a figure of eight. God is the one covenant partner. But who's Abram seeing? He sees someone saying, I'm dying to myself. I'm giving up the rights to my own life. I'm beginning a new walk with my covenant partner unto death. God is the covenant partner. Someone is saying, not my will, God, but yours be done as my covenant partner. And Abram sees a brilliant glow. Abram described it as a smoking furnace and a burning lamp, bright light. What did Abram see? Matthew 17 tells us, verse 2, And he was transfigured before them. This was Jesus when he appeared to two of his disciples. His face shone like the sun, and, he clo and his clothes became as white as the light. Also in Revelation 1, verse 14 and 15, His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, 
and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. Abram sees Christ walking in his place. Christ, the eternal Son of God, in his pre-existing glory, cut covenant with God the Father and stood in for Abram. He is the only one who could stand in for Abram, and all of Abram's unborn seed were included in the covenant because they were in Abram. The sacrifice, remember, was always symbolic of the flesh and blood of the one who made the walk. So this sacrifice pointed to Christ himself, who would sometime in the future come as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Remember, the blood of animals covered sin, but the blood of Jesus takes it away. There was also a scar, a scar that sealed and testified to this covenant, and this was circumcision. It was a token of the everlasting covenant. There was also a changing of names, according to the ritual. In Hebrew, God is Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. God took the H in his name, and Abram became Abraham, and Sarah became Sarah with an H. God took on Abram's name, became known as the God of Abram. Now that the covenant is cut, they are known as friends. James 2.23 says the following, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Abram is now the covenant friend of God, and God has promised him a seed through Sarah, a land of rest and blessings on his descendants. The problem now, Abram is 100 years old. Sarah is 90. He is impotent, and she is past the age of childbearing. God puts it nicely in Genesis 18.11, where he says, Now Abram and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. So if Abram is going to have a son, it's probably got to be a supernatural birth. He never had a covenant partner like God before. It takes him a while to get used to the level and the magnitude of promises coming from having such a covenant partner. It's just not everybody you cut covenant with that delivers in the divine style. But Abram finally comes to the persuasion that God is bound to the covenant and can't break it because he made a promise. So he has to deliver. And so Isaac is born and God is living up to his part of the covenant. Now there's a test. You'll recall that Abram slept through the covenant ceremony and God did it all. God is so far proving himself faithful. And now it's time to test Abram's faithfulness to the covenant. Remember when a covenant is cut, each party completely surrenders himself in loving trust to the other party, willing to give his total being, his total life, his total heart to the one who he is in covenant with. One way to test if Abram is committed to this covenant is the following, and that is to test Abram with what is most dear to him, his only son. Devotees to pagan idols in this time would give their firstborn, and this was common practice. Would Abram do the same for his God? God is saying, are you willing to give what is most dear to you and prove that you love me? So God instructs Abram to take Isaac and to the place where he will have to sacrifice him. And this is a three-day journey. They take the donkeys, they take some servants with them, they load with the wood, and they start on this three-day journey. The last day, Abram leaves the, the servants at the foot of the mountain and Isaac carries the wood as they proceed to the place where Isaac is to be sacrificed. On the way to the top, Isaac asks Abram, Father, we have the wood and the flint to make the fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abram answers in Genesis 22, 8. Abram said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. 
From this statement, we see that Abram believed God would provide. Hebrews 11, 19 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he, would had, he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abraham trusted God. Abraham had faith because he stood in a covenant. God said that through his seed, his descendants will be blessed. Abram knew that this was his only son, and Abram knew that God would provide. He knew that God would either raise him from the dead or that he would provide a different or an alternative sacrifice. We all know how the story ends. Isaac is spared, and God provided a lamb that he could sacrifice. In conclusion, to ask the question, what did Abram believe? First of all, he believed in a supernatural birth, that God would supernaturally bring a son into this world. God did, and he called him Isaac. He believed God enough to offer his own son, and he did. He believed for three days that his son was as good as dead, and he was. He believed God would provide a sacrifice substitute or raise his son from the dead with many children coming to him through his son Isaac, and he did. He believed because God made a promise. He cut a covenant. Because Abraham believed these things in his heart, God gave Abraham his, God's, own robe of righteousness. Because of Abraham's faith, God was his shield. He was his protection. The righteousness of God was credited or counted to Abram, Abram's behalf because he believed. God is saying the following to you. When I give you a promise, wait in faith, be patient, and allow me to prepare you. Allow me to mature the time, the season, and also your character. Maybe you will have to lay down the very promise and allow it to die in you, for it to be able to come into fulfillment, to make sure that you do not walk the journey for the glory of the fulfillment, but because you love me and have a heart to obey me. Do not make an idol of the promise. Abide in faith and obedience, and keep your eyes on the promise giver. My faithfulness will bring fulfillment to my promises. You might be finding yourself in a situation in this time that you are scared, that you are uncertain of what's going to happen. Um, you might be fearful and you might be thinking that this situation is hopeless. I want to remind you today that God made a promise to you, that God sent his only son to die for you and that he promised that he will never leave you that he will never forsake you. He is your shield. He is your protection. He will give you hope and he will give you a future. So let's trust God to fulfill in his promises. Let's trust his faithfulness. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you are a good Father. We thank you that you are not angry with us. We thank you, Lord, that you care deeply for us. We thank you that you say in your scriptures that you are mindful of us and we are the object of your love and your attention. Thank you, Lord, that you've made promises. Thank you that you are God that keeps promises. Thank you that your faithfulness will fulfill your promises. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can stand in covenant with you. Thank you that you sent Jesus as a substitute to die on our behalf, not because we deserve it, but because you love us. And as a result of, this, a result of that, Lord, we have gained victory. We can enter into your presence. Father, I pray for every single person that's watching this right now, Lord, that you will bless them, that you will make your face shine upon them, that they can declare your promises over their situation. Lord, thank you that this virus, Lord, um, 
that you are mightier than the virus. We acknowledge it, Lord, but we also acknowledge the fact that you are mightier than what we are going through at the moment and that you will bring us through. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are only a few days into lockdown, and for some, it comes with much desperation and fear. Some of us would much rather and very easily bury our heads in the ground and hibernate. We all have a choice to make, and that is to either isolate or stay connected. I want to read to you from Hebrews 10 verses 24 to 25. Dis discover creative ways to encourage each other and to motivate towards acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together, as some have formed the habit of doing, because we need each other. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other on towards the anticipated day of dawning. Hebrews exhorts us to discover creative ways to encourage others. And then it goes on to say, as expressions of love, and never a more desperate time than now, where we have the opportunity to love on people. So we would like to present you with a challenge in this coming week. And that is the opportunity and choice to stay connected. If you're part of our Remembrance family, this challenge is specifically geared at you to contact someone in our community. If you're not, contact the people in your circle of friends, whether it be family or colleagues. Send them a message, give them a call, but hear how they are coping. How are they coping with the lockdown? We trust that the Lord will give you a word in season to encourage them as you reach out to them in this coming week. Please let us know that you are accepting the challenge or opportunity and type accept in the chat tab. We are praying for you this coming week and look forward to meeting again next Sunday, same place and same time.